what we're seeing is that change happens one conversation at a time and that we all, those of us looking for that change need to be up for those conversations. Hi, this is Frank Schaefer, and you are watching and or listening to my podcast in conversation with Frank Schaefer. And this will be a live Facebook event. And then it goes out on YouTube and all sorts of other places and then becomes podcast as well. Today, my conversation is with uh, Kristen Hall, who is the founder and CEO of, and Kristen, correct me, is it NIA or NIA Impact it's Capital? NIA. NIA, NIA Impact, Impact Capital. Capital. Mm -hmm. And that is, uh, I'm just reading here, and then we're going to really get into it, exploring the importance of representation and inclusion within the realms of finance and investing. And I met Kristen in the context of a WBC meeting, which is the Women's Business Collaborative uh, run by um, friend e Edie uh, and Jose Zilstra. Um, and a bunch of other wonderful women who do all sorts of crazy and wonderful things meeting across the globe by Zoom with people from the UK and India and who knows where. And in the context of those meetings, what we really wind up discussing and hearing about is leaders in various fields who are working on inclusion issues for women, people of color, anybody really, but I guess the the... the the flying wedge here is, is women's issues. So Kristen, before we dive into all that, um, let me just talk to you about who you are uh, and then we'll get into what you do and all these very interesting things. You, you mentioned you're sitting in California right now. Is that where you live? Mm -hmm. I live in Oakland, California. And then you also mentioned that you were gonna move. Where are you headed? Just to Berkeley. Just to, okay, to, just to uh, Berkeley. Uh, yes. Yeah. Small move. Well, I have a sister-in-law in Alameda my wife's from San Francisco and her, another sister of hers lives up in the wine country. So we, we get out that way. Are you a Californian? I am. I was born here. I'm a fifth generation Californian. My kids are sixth. That's great. Speaking of kids, who, who, who are we talking about and what kind of ages these days? Um, I have two sons in their 20s. Oh, good for you. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, and are they in California now as well? They are. Yeah. The older one is in San Francisco and the younger one in Santa Barbara. And everybody doing well? You know, that's such a good question. How, how the state of the world, how can any of us really be thriving at this time Yeah. Um, with the weight of the world and everything that's happening? Um, and I think they're both, you know, doing their best to navigate all of our issues. Yeah. Well, that's a good answer because it's, it, it is an amazing time. Um, you know, my three kids are grown and now I'm helping take care of three of my five grandchildren who happen to live across the street. So as you look at what's facing people, uh, what's ahead for all of us, it's, it's hard. And of course, you're kind of on the cutting edge of this idea of inclusion, and then you work on the financial side. So let's talk a little bit about this uh, project that you started. When did you start it and, and what's it all about? And then we can get into some questions related to that. That sounds great. Yeah. Thank you for having me today. Yeah, my pleasure. So um, I founded NIA Impact Capital, and NIA means intention and purpose. Mm -hmm. So, and that word comes to me from the Swahili, and then before that, Arabic and the Punjab. And um, so really thinking about how we can do our economy and our investing with intention and purpose. Mm -hmm. So we bring that into our daily lives in our company. We're women-led. We're a B Corp. We're actually um, the highest rated uh, financial services among benefit uh, corporations. And we're also gender equity now certified. So what does that mean as far as thinking about balance and then thinking about really planning for success and planning for inclusion and what are the practices and policies that need to happen in a company or an organization to get to the outcomes that we want that will work for everybody. And so then we take those lenses and use them when we are evaluating companies. We build portfolios in publicly traded companies. Um, we actually just launched our first mutual fund, um, N-I-A-G-X, um, all mutual funds end in an X. So that's kind of our wordle for the day. And so um, uh, concentrated portfolio of solutions focused companies, all of which have um, diversity and leadership. Hmm. What, what is your kind of background that, you know, when, when, when you're 
looking at back at the last 10, 15, 20 years of your life, what, what is the kind of path that brings you to this juncture and how did you get there? Um, it's a great question. And I didn't get here in a linear path, although the through line is really consistent for me. I've always been a change maker. I happen to grow up in a trading firm. My dad started a business as one does in our garage in California. And mm -hmm. so we have been talking puts, calls, um, pork pellies, uh, futures, commodities and options, you mm -hmm. know, since I was 14, you know, in the back of the station wagon. And so really grew up in that firm, in that company. And learned early, early on in our family company, how to buy low and sell high as often as one possibly can. And that's what you do in a high frequency trading algorithmic company. Um, so I knew how to harness the financial markets for financial gain. And we were able to do that really well. Um, in the rest of my life, I actually became a school teacher. I went to school, um, studied critical race theory um, and social change in education um, and really looking at our systems and our largest systems as replicating our society. And if we want to make changes, we need to do that in our largest systems. And so I had been doing that in the field of education when we ended up selling our trading firm, it was a time for me and the rest of the, you know, my dad and people in our family to step back. Um, and I really looked at my life and looked at my skill set and looked at what I was doing and said, it's really time to combine these worlds. Mm -hmm. And so what if we could harness the financial markets for environmental gains and for social justice that I had been doing in the other part of my life? And so I brought everything together. And that's really the, the outcome in the process at NIA is to really harness our financial markets. And really, we, if you think about it, we get the economy that we invest into. Mm -hmm. So what if we invest into the economy that we want that works for everyone? So we're talking about sustainability and then also inclusive and positive workspaces. How long has this been, have you been working on NIA? Um, I started this type of investing as an impact investor kind of uh, in um, um, small companies, largely investing into women and people of color in my local community in Oakland, California um, in 2007. Mm -hmm. And I had been doing that for a while. And, and in, in the path of my own portfolio and doing that in Oakland, I met with many endowments, foundation leaders, organizations, um, family offices who wanted to do that type of investing. And so um, it wasn't until 2000. 12, I came up with our six solution themes um, and then launched our first um, portfolio in 2013. And then um, this company kind of came later as an as a kind of an out, outcome of, of that process. So at any rate, our, our track record on this particular portfolio is um, 2015. Mm -hmm. um, so I've been at it for a while. Yeah. When you when you look at what you're doing, what sort of scale are we talking about so people can get a feel for what NIA represents? How, how do you measure that in terms of not just impact, but uh, you know, how, how large an operation is this? How many people are you working with? Give us an idea of the scope of what you're doing. Sure, sure. So we are actually looking at measuring our impacts on all different levels. And so, because people ask us, you know, why NIA, why now, you know, and, and how can we articulate why what we're doing is so important and why, um, you know, I guess at some point we're trying to make change irresistible. So showing what does it mean? Um, so a few things we look at as far as uh, measuring our success and then also just what the world needs. Um, asset management firms, which is what NIA is, um, manage about $80 trillion, you know, across the spectrum, across our um, global investments. And sure. women and people of color owned firms make up 1% of that 80 trillion. So, um, and what would our economy look like if there were different types of decision makers, you know, deciding what types of companies get investment and what own. So, so that's one of the reasons we're doing it. So we're trying to grow our assets and our, it's called AUM, um, assets under management, um, so that we're poking away, chipping away at that number and growing it. Um, we currently employ about 10 people and we um, you know, look to expand that because part of our vision is really changing the face of finance. So we have a change the face of finance internship program where we welcome in um, young people um, 
and really train them in what it means to invest sustainably and for the planet and the economy that we want to have. Um, then we also uh, measure success over our um, our performance. So we have to deliver financial returns. So we have a great, uh, you know, uh, I guess, history as far as our seven years of investing. And so, of course, we measure that against our incumbent, in our incumbent economy, our, I guess, our benchmark. So the S&P 500 is something everyone knows. We're not trying to be that. And yet, of course, as a women-led firm, we have to beat that. Um, and then also looking, another one is the MISCI ACWI. And so looking at how we are benchmarking our financial performance. And then we're also looking at how we're, um, having a positive impact. And so, you know, largely this movement that's now kind of being called ESG, environment, um, social and governments, and looking at those kind of three prongs of a company um, building portfolios, we wanna have a positive impact. So we actually communicate and engage with every single one of our companies on the topics that we see will help them grow. And so it's often on diversity, equity, and inclusion issues. Um, how can they have the policies and practices that will foster a positive um, and inclusive company culture? You know, so everything from removing forced arbitration because it's associated with um, sexual harassment and racial discrimination um, to looking at hiring practices and recruiting and our, our, our companies like our cybersecurity companies, are they going into the local high schools and really explaining the career path and helping people get into those types of things, offering educational programming. Um, some of our companies, we ask them to do a racial equity audit so that they're really clear about where they're being inclusive and where they can improve. So those are other ways that we measure our impact and our success is how our engagements um, with our companies um, one one that's been in the news recently is you know we've been after Tesla to look at their racial discrimination for years, and and now it's been removed from some of the sustainability index um, based largely on on some of our work and and others to to really call them out on these issues. It's great. I was about to interrupt you and oh, do, ask do, a question, please, please. but fortunately I didn't because I was just um, getting ready to ask a question when you brought up the Tesla thing, but it's a perfect segue into what I wanted to interrupt you with, which was, it seems to me that in the context of our, our moment in history and the political climate that we are in and the way uh, assets and, and income are so tilted toward a very small group of people who tend to be white males in our culture, uh, you know, when I when I talk with folks at the WBC and other organizations involving women and corporations, I think there's a temptation to try to avoid politics as a bit divisive sometimes. But on the other hand, I think the context of what you're doing, Kristen, cannot be anything but political in that you're asking the kind of questions about diversity and inclusion and racism and other things that inevitably um, go there. So I'm just wondering, um, off the record, as it were, how you position yourself to work with corporations and people who, I guess, try to avoid being pigeonholed politically for business reasons. They don't want to come down on one side or the other, maybe give to both parties in terms of donations to, to political candidates, both Republican and Democrat. But on the other hand, in today's polarized world, how are we going to escape taking sides on some of these issues that have a direct impact on issues of equality and inclusion? Because it seems to me that, you know, both political parties are not the same on these issues. The context in which you and I are having this discussion now is the context in which we're seeing Roe v. Wade probably reversed. I don't think we are going to be able to duck taking positions on things um, any more than, um, Europeans can duck the fact that they either are going to have defense budgets or not in the light of the invasion of Ukraine by this by Russia. You know, we're at a time now whether whether business likes it or not, positions have to be taken. So where do you, Kristen, and position what you do and how do you handle that personally? Um, aside from all the corporate stuff, you know, I, I'm looking, I'm not looking, this is not a rhetorical question. I'm literally asking you how you're positioning yourself in a in a very uh, a moment in which you know we we we're, we're walking very fine lines on a lot of issues here. Yeah, I really appreciate the question, and it's really the question of our times. Yes, where are any of us going to fall? And and 
not, not only where do we fall, where do we stand up? You know, it's not a time to sit on the fence. We can't, you know, that line is thin. Um, and, you know, if we're not speaking out, that means that we are really condoning the status quo. Yeah. And is that working for ourselves? Is it working for our families, for our communities? Um, and so those are the questions we need to ask, especially when it comes to business, right? And so we're looking at financial outcomes and what are the social and governance issues that play into our financial outcomes, um, particular for each of our companies. And so we're definitely calling on each of our companies, asking them. So for months ago, we've been asking companies um, where do they stand on this issue, knowing that it's going to affect their employees and their families, you know, and so um, can we have women under attack or women feeling threatened or women not having full access to reproductive care? Mm. Um, you know, and then we're looking at where companies are located because we know, everybody knows the red states aren't prepared for the enormous amount of, um, you know, babies that are going to, to, to be populating those states. And so what will it mean to be located having a headquarters or otherwise in, in a state that's, that's not prepared for its own outcomes, you know? So, um, one example of, of what we are doing is, you know, asking our CEOs to make statements and what are our companies doing to really make sure that um, everybody in their firm, so it's not just women, we're looking for everybody that they're going to have access to what they need. So in this case, women reproductive rights, are there going to be travel budgets um, and, and compensation for women that need to travel for family planning? Um, uh, you know, on the flip side, uh, it's not necessarily the place that business needs to play. This traditionally has been government education, et cetera, as far as getting education out about how to prevent unwanted pregnancies. Will we ask corporations to step in and make sure that everyone has access just to our biology and our information about um, preventing pregnancy? So um, it's it's definitely an interesting time to be in business because um you know, the, the, the borders are being brought down about what is political, what is educational, what is governance. And so there's a big role for corporations to play right now, mm -hmm. um, just as on the environmental side, you know, we're all asking, well, we all, you know, the SEC largely and, you know, some government bodies, in addition to investors, are asking about scope one emissions, scope two emissions, and more transparency about what's happening on the environmental side. We also need to ask for the social and governance side as well. Yeah, just to roll back a little bit to what you were saying earlier, tell me a little more about the Tesla story and how that unfolded for you, because obviously, you know, um, the news was published in various places and commented on that they had kind of been outed on some of this. How, how do you fit in with that? And what's what's going on with all of that? Tell me a little more about that. Sure, sure. So we identified early on that Tesla had racial discrimination issues and we filed um, well, we tried, well, what we do with all of our companies is we really try to have a win-win dialogue. So we mm -hmm. look for a meeting, we look to share, well, we look to listen first. I mean, we really are here to listen and to find out from them to the extent they can be transparent and share with us. We're here to have a win-win dialogue um, and a win-win relationship. We're long-term investors. So we really see ourselves as in partnership with these companies mm -hmm. um, that we place into our portfolio. And Tesla really wasn't there for that. Um, and they were quite dismissive of our um yeah of our questions didn't get back to us so so when when a company isn't there to have that dialogue then the sec mm. is there so we filed a shareholder resolution um three years ago on forced arbitration because having arbitration in employee contracts um a limit limits employee rights and their ability for redress on multiple levels so um, it also keeps voices silenced, um, particularly when there's concealment clauses like NDAs, um, yes. so which in this case, um, Elon Musk is, you know, there was an NDA um, for this sexual harassment situation um, mm -hmm. and silenced that person. And so when women and people of color, um, marginalized groups are silenced, then they're often not moving up in the company. And that's what this person is alleging too, that they, um, they're, 
growth and opportunities when the, within the company were reduced or eliminated. Um, and so that's what happened. So if we're looking for the, the best possible outcome is diversity and leadership in all levels because the research shows that diverse teams have better outcomes on ROI on, on across the spectrum. So we're really looking for that inclusive environment and some of these practices limit, reduce, prohibit those. So, so at any rate, we filed with the SEC on forced arbitration. The employees at Tesla saw that and saw us as an ally. And so many of them came to us um, sharing stories of discrimination. And of course, we're an asset manager and we, we want to help and we can be that ally and we can file. But what we did was suggest that they file with the state of California. Many of them did. So many of them did that the state of California started the, the racial discrimination lawsuit. Mm -hmm. So at any rate, we filed again with the SEC the following year. And then this year we filed. So we're a third year with filing and getting that resolution. So I'll be giving a speech at their AGM meeting um, later, probably in August. Now whose meeting is that? The Tesla um, shareholder meeting. I mean, you're going to be there. And this is obviously without the blessing of Elon Musk, this would be the shareholders bringing you in or who who is your host? Well, so they well, this is interesting because the last two years I've done that speech from my kitchen table because mm -hmm. it's been remote. Yeah. And so we don't know yet whether um, and, and last year, interestingly enough, they held it in Austin. That was their big announcement that they're moving headquarters and um, which was the same um, week that they actually were fined $137 million for racial discrimination issues. Um, but I think that the, the headline was Tesla's moving to Austin and some of the, some of the others got missed. So they did have people at that meeting, though those of us that were giving speeches on issues that uh, the, the board or, or the CEO didn't like were not invited to that meeting. And so I did that uh, remotely. So I'm not sure, um, you know, the, the pandemic has definitely changed the way we do shareholder activism um, and, and the remote. So we'll see, we'll see what happens. I'm anticipating that will be in person. Mm. You know, brings up a, a related question that I'm, I'm just asking you as, a, as an observer of these things, Kristen. Um, it seems to me that Elon Musk and, and Jeff Bezos and a number of the others, you know, the, the, this white male hierarchy that runs so much of the tech industry, you know, has not been particularly friendly to women or minorities in many ways, um, whether it's anti-union activities on the part of Bezos or what we see with Elon Musk and, and this uh, allegation of sexual impropriety and so on, that all seems to be part of the same kind of package. How, you know, how do you feel as a woman entrepreneur who is in this arena at a time when uh, the Gilded Age has been resurrected by a particular type of white male that, you know, makes the, um, the Gilded Age people of the actual Gilded Age look kind of mild in comparison to this sort of engulf and devour mentality that has in particular not had room for employee rights or much room for social activism on the side of inclusion. You know, if, if anything typifies Silicon Valley, it is not inclusion of women. And it certainly has not been anything that reflects the sort of thing that you, Kristen, are talking about. So not only are you a kind of a fish out of water in terms of this moment of history, you're very much swimming upstream, it seems to me, to the degree that you get in the water at all you have to be giving this some thought. I'd really like to hear you talk just about this whole, whole environment. And then you brought up Tesla. And of course, that's the cutting edge of the whole tech thing. I, I, I am very disappointed in, in what tech has turned into anyway. And one of the big disappointments is not only the lack of inclusion, but it's worse than that. It's a turn towards a kind of a libertarian right-wing philosophy that really doesn't have room for much more than just making more money. Oh, there's so much there. There's so much there. So yes, I live, you know, almost in the belly of the beast. You know, Oakland is to, it's kind of an extension of Silicon Valley, sure. um, where it is definitely the bro show, and it is, um, you know, it's really too bad because you know, to Silicon Valley and our our entrepreneurs have branded themselves on innovation, you know, and they just speaking for that that industry, which I really shouldn't speak for. Um, you know, so many of us, particularly in California, have been so proud of some of the innovations that have come, um, world changing, you know, 
able to search at, at our fingertips, you know, to be able to talk on the phone, to connect, you know, all, so much has come um, from here. And yet um, there are blind spots. We all have blind spots mm -hmm. and wanting all of our companies and each of our entrepreneurs to be able to reduce and eliminate blind spots for the betterment of each other and our society and our globe. And in the case of Tesla, you know, that, that CEO and that entire company is branded on sustainability um, mm. for our earth. And yet if they're going to innovate for sustainability for our earth and discriminate against people and cause human um, rights crises across the globe, um, that's an issue, you know? Mm. So, and one example that we engage with them about is um, child labor in the mines in the Congo. And so, um, and where their position had been, well, that's a government issue, you know, that, that that's up to the countries in Africa to take care of. And I said to them, that's actually a supply and demand issue. You know, if Tesla were to say that we are going to um, only collect our materials from mines that have human rights, um, you know, policies, um, offer education to children and meals to children so that they don't need to be, you know, there, then that would change because mm -hmm. we know the, the, the properties um, of supply and demand. And mm -hmm. could Tesla step into um, the, the right side of history on some of these issues, they can, you know, and so at any rate, some of the patriarchy, some of the let's get it done fast and quickly, and that's somebody else's to worry about, we're doing this. Um, it's time for us to be holistic, because every decision that these large companies and, and some of these CEOs make um, really does have ripple effects throughout the economy and throughout our society. Yeah, and you know, you keep running into stories that suddenly become a pattern whether it's Google and Facebook not changing their algorithms in a way that would favor young women who have been raped and had their rape videos posted that go viral or live streaming acts of terror. It, it always seems to me that these companies have a pattern here of reacting when they're finally called on something by someone like you with Tesla and what's going on. I don't know how to describe the general tenure of the tech industry at any better than a kind of a sociopathic self-involvement that never seems to have the empathy first, but always has to be called to the empathy second. I'm not saying that describes everybody, but you know, th there were these articles in the New York Times, a whole series on the way the, the, you know, Google had set up its search engines and did nothing about the fact that some of the fringe uh, elements of the porn industry were trafficking videos of young women who had been raped and so forth and doing very little to, to curtail that. And then, you know, we have a whole election in 2016 that's still up in the air because Facebook would not really do something until they were called on it. And then you have the whole issue here with Tesla. What, it, what is the common denominator with these white men who have made so much money um, and the libertarian philosophy that always waits for someone else to, whether it's changed child labor policy in Africa or you know, fair wages in China, uh, building so much of our stuff. It, it just seems that, you know, again and again and again, um, the, 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 there's the sort of ideal of the tech industry that came forward in the 90s and the early part of this century. And then there's the reality of an almost sociopathic disregard for the impact of what they're doing. Just take t teenagers and cell phone addiction and the levels of depression now in young people directly tracking to the way a lot of these uh, sites have been set up to almost be addictive on purpose, if not actually on purpose. I don't even know where to begin or where to end on this, but it seems to me someone who's trying to explore investment with a moral component to it, you're going to be looking at these issues and related issues. And I just wonder, you know, how you how you deal with all of that. Absolutely. So it's a lot. It's a lot. And so, you know, and again, a lot of these entrepreneurs have incredible um, you know, innovation, you know, many of them are incredibly smart. And again, you know, so many have blind spots. And so that's where the board comes in, you know, the board of directors um, really is the boss or, you know, uh, the, the answering responsible party for that CEO, both to support them to eliminate those blind spots and to call them out. Um, you know, so, so that system isn't perfect. Clearly, you know, we, we have some boards that are not governing the way that we um, as investors would like, um, because it also eliminates 
eliminating these blind spots reduces risks for investors. It reduces risks within the company. And so um, we're definitely watching where political donations are going because that tells a story, you know, who are you in bed with and, and for what purposes. So, so that's something we watch very carefully. And then we're also watching board composition because we know that a diverse board um, governs well. And there, there's quite a few statistics, um, you know, and, and some research behind that. So um, then, you know, we're also in conversation with the SEC about their role, you know, and what does it mean to govern some of these CEOs during during this time, um, you know, when uh, political parties are, I, I, without getting too political, I think we can easily say that none of the political parties are working well, and whether that means the two-party system is difficult, whether, you know, th there's so many issues that, uh, you know, institutions are failing, you know, from the Supreme Court, you know, to the Senate, to, to, mm -hmm. to other places, and so watching as an investor, what is the role of the CEO? What is the role of the company? What is our role? You know, and, and fortunately we can raise our voice and our issue. And so another example of us doing that is at Apple. And um, that's very much a David and Goliath story. Um, and it's still being played out. Although we we did have concerns because they they do use concealment clauses in employee contracts, and yet they told us in the SEC that they didn't. And so that got really problematic. Um, and we did a shareholder resolution and we actually won that. And so we're now hoping for, um, again, a win-win conversation and a dialogue with the board to really make sure that employees are protected um, you know, as these companies are growing, because we do need them to be more innovative, particularly when it comes to the people you know, and the human rights in addition to the environment. Well, I have a question for you. And again, it's not a rhetorical question. It's a real one. I, and by the way, I, I find what you're saying just fascinating and enlightening. So thank you for taking the time to help us. Um, but, you know, you're talking about blind spots when it comes to Tesla and some of these other corporations. But it, at what point is it no longer a blind spot? But this is what tech has become. And it is. I mean, you know, there were blind spots in Germany in the 1920s, but by the 1930s, it wasn't a blind spot. It was fascism. And I think when you look at the blind spots of the tech industry and this kind of sociopathic inability to do good, but instead to be basically agents of harm, finally, if you look at any of the writing by the neuropsychologists on what's happening to young people today with cell phones, for instance, you can't blame someone in saying it should have never been invented, but at a certain point, there is culpability and instead, what we get is whistleblowers from Facebook and other similar corporations telling us that this was done on purpose and that they've done everything in their power to avoid accountability. The example you just did with Apple, for instance, uh, where they're saying they're not doing these NDAs, but they are, et cetera. You know, so my question for you, Kristen, is, is when is it no longer a blind spot, but when is it actually we just have to face the fact that the tech industry as a whole is not an agency for good? or for change of the kind we want, but actually a very profitable enterprise run by a few um, folks who have made a lot of money, but they've made it off the backs of the rest of us in terms of our own value of our lives. They have diminished the value of our lives, the pleasure of our lives. They have not increased them. So not, you know, it's nice to do a Google search, but I was a writer before Google and I was able to do research in libraries and I was fine, but I wasn't worrying about grandchildren who are addicted to cell phones. I wasn't worried about a whole generation who no longer reads. You know, at a certain point, there's going to be a reckoning. And I'm just wondering whether it comes because of someone like you filing uh, these issues with the SEC, how, how do we get, in a, how do we make these guys accountable? I mean, you know, Tesla is an example. He's talking about starting a multi-billion dollar legal thing to fight any kind of challenge or even allegations of sexual impropriety. How do we go up against zillionaires who don't seem to have a social conscience or even in North Star by which they navigate any decision other than the next profitable thing they do. I, I, I just don't think these people have a moral bone in their body. I just don't get it. I think it's, it's off the rail. I just wonder when it's not a blind spot anymore and when it's a, something that is a, a real enemy of our of civil society. So that's a big topic, and it's um, what I'll, how I'll answer it is something that we're working on. And how will these things change? You know, how will we have the world and the society that we want? Um, it 
what we know is that our economy changes by what we invest in and that we get what we invest in. We get the economy that we invest in. So can we invest in those companies that are doing well by doing good and doing good by doing well by people and planet? And so at NIA, our job then is creating portfolios of solutions focused companies that are doing just that um, and speaking out and helping those companies. So getting moving more dollars out of our incumbent economy, the s and um, you know, if you think about it, the S&P 500, that's our largest, our, our U.S. largest companies. It's our most popular index. Um, clearly, you know, with no offense to the, to the, you know, beautiful men on this call, that's very linear and it's very male thought focused. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, we as women know that size doesn't matter and investing into the largest companies and very U.S. centric doesn't even make sense. Mm-hmm. Um, we want to be able to choose our companies by what is their business model? Where does their revenues come from? And are they profiting from purpose um, or are they profiting from something else that's actually destructive, harmful, um, extractive? You know, mm-hmm. we want to eliminate extraction from our planet and from our communities, right? So mm-hmm. um, choosing companies based on size and their headquarter domicile makes zero sense. Can so I ask you a question? Can I yes. just ask you for a clarification yeah. there? Can you name any company that is in the realm of tech that we've been talking about that is doing exactly what you're calling for here and not just some startup that started on Wednesday, but like someone that we may have even heard of that's actually got this right. I can't think of one, but I'm not challenging you. I'm asking you if there is an example where you say, oh, if only everybody was like X, Y, Z, we would have solved our problems. Is there such a, is there a tech entity that is getting this right that is also um, quote unquote successful. Yeah. So, um, it's a great question. Um, is there a perfect company? No, there's not a perfect company. Okay. out there. Is anybody um, even coming close in the, in yeah. the high powered, sexy tech world? So, um, yeah, we have a few, um, definitely on our biotech. Well, so every industry has its own issues. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, although I just have to say in our large tech, we have very few in our portfolio. We have very few. We do have some really interesting cybersecurity names, knowing mm-hmm. that um, that's almost like the industry that we're in. I think with the Russia situation, right. we're being called to really understand more of the issues and how we need to protect particularly women in color from engaging in our economy um, and our banking and our finances. And so but the, it, in, it I, interests me that you just said of the big tech companies, you don't have any. In your portfolios. Okay, well, no, we have Apple, which is the largest. Okay, so um, you have Apple. Now, why would you include Apple? Tell me something nice about Apple. Okay, sure. So reasons for inclusion. Um, I'll just start that they do have the only openly gay CEO. Um, and that is so hard to come by Um in our society. So celebrating that diversity at the very top is an important criteria for us. That's not the only one. Um, And I'm not saying Apple doesn't have issues because we take them to task. You know, we went to the SEC with this because we do see that they have issues. Um, We, going back to their educational arm, they're really ramping that up. So what they do for classrooms, we're really excited about. Um, What does Apple do for women? Um, You know, that's a good question. They are, you know, and right off the top of my head, I don't have my research notes specifically about what they do for women. They do have a diverse board. That's one of their criteria that we look for um, mm-hmm. is a diverse board. And so um, actually more than 50% of the companies we look at get eliminated um, due to lack of diversity in leadership. and leadership. And how about manufacturing in terms of the kind of people they employ, child labor, abuse of that, the same sort of thing you were talking about with Tesla in Africa that they won't do anything about? What's where's Apple on those sorts of things? Well, one of the things that they're doing, and again, I don't really want to defend any of all of these. No, no, I understand. I'm just- The reason, because they do have issues. Um, and they have been very vocal. In fact, the, the largest and the, um, I guess the broadest and the biggest as far as making sustainability commitments. Mm. So to have our- um, largest company in the world making these commitments to be net zero, um, you know, and even negative in their carbon mm. offputs. That that's a big deal. You know, we need our yeah. sustainability there. Well, but seriously, I'm not being facetious when I say, well, thank God for something because the thing is, you know, I, it's such a privilege talking to you, Kristen, because you you actually know things. You know, whereas 
some of us out here think and hope stuff, but you're doing the research and the hard work. So thank you. But it's wonderful to know that at least in Apple, you have a little bit of a template of the direction, if not the achievement that other big, big companies might be able to aspire to. So it doesn't, you know, I just don't want to finish this podcast. We're not near the end yet, but I'm, you know, I don't want to feel hopeless about it. It's like, oh yeah, well, there's somebody who's on the right track. Can we at least say that about Apple? Yeah. And I would say largely they're on the right track and most Apple employees do seem to be pretty happy. Mm. Um, Now, are they doing a great job by women and people of color? They can do better. They can absolutely do better. So what does it look like for them to be even more inclusive um, and deliberate about creating that positive company culture? Mm. Let me pause for a minute. No, no, go right ahead. I don't want to interrupt you. Go ahead. Just... Um, one of the issues we're coming up with uh, companies like Apple is, you know, an NDA is completely appropriate. If they're coming out with a new iPad, the next version of the sure, phone, of course. I can't work for them and then take that over to Google or Tesla or Absolutely. anywhere else, right? In particular, we're talking about AI, we're talking about self-driving yeah. cars, you know, there's, there's a lot going on. And yet that NDA should not govern my experience um, of being an employee at that firm. Yeah. And, and if that, you're abused, you've got a right to tell somebody. I mean, you're not you know, I know what you're talking about there. When you when you have, um, you know, what, what what I wanted to pause and just remind people you're watching and, and listening to um, in conversation with Frank Schaefer, and I'm talking today with Kristen Hall, founder and CEO of NIA, correct? Yep. Yep. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I- Impact Capital. And that is a company or a group of people who are trying to direct uh, the rest of our investment portfolios towards companies that are doing some things that are right and rather than just this negative uh, kind of stuff we're talking about. And I'm just stunned, Kristen, that you've had such a part in these SEC filings and other things that have um, you know, made the news. Are you getting a blowback from folks who are affected? You know, Some of these billionaires probably don't particularly like you or what you're doing. Um, and they're talking about spending a lot of their own money on fighting the kind of things you're trying to do. How does that all come out in the, in the wash? You know, I get asked similar questions because I had a real journey and change of heart from my, my, uh, you know, right wing fundamentalist background into what the position I'm in. And I've, I've made some folks along the way who don't particularly like what I'm doing. So I'm aware of, of blowback. And I'm just wondering how that, how you are faring in the midst of that, knowing that people like Elon Musk, to the degree he would ever think about you, don't like you and has a lot of resources. Yeah, to my knowledge, I haven't been tweeted at yet. So um, yeah, I definitely have, you know, my friends, you know, when the New York Times articles come out, they're worried for my safety, um, which is, um, which is a problem, which is a problem, you know, but, and yet I'm here to name injustice, and we're here to work toward the society that works for everybody. When they talk talk about being worried about your safety, I don't want to just blow by that. What do they mean by that? And where would that threat come from? Because I have people who sometimes worry for my safety too, and I can, we're not going into it here because we're talking to you today, but where would that kind of uh, aggression come from that would actually jeopardize you either physically or legally or in some other way? Um, well, for better, or for worse, I'm really not worried about it. Although, uh, you know, you call out someone like Elon Musk for poor human management practices right. um, or racism directly. Um for child labor in uh, Africa, you know, direct deals where they are working with minds that use child labor. Um, He doesn't want to hear that. Um, I I personally am not worried about my safety and yet others, you know, he, he, he has known to be irrational. He's been known to be volatile. Um, So I think that that some of that fear is coming from some of his own behavior that, you know, is exhibited. Um, We do know, you know, we have plenty of reports from employees about um, just rash firings and you know where they don't feel safe as an employee many of them don't feel safe because mm. he could come in and fire an entire team um, on a whim and mm. and that does happen uh, we have multiple reports of that i'm not a tesla employee I, I you know i'm over here just running a portfolio that tesla is not in any longer because mm. of poor practices yeah it seems to me that of the various ceos one could talk about you know musk and others that he 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 seems to be flying pretty close to the pretty close to the edge on a lot of issues in terms of retributive behavior toward people um, and the kind of things you get on Twitter and other places. It's just very interesting to me to read about that in one venue and talk to someone who's directly affected in another. 
Um, so let, let's move on now. Um, what do you see for yourself and for Nia and what you are doing in terms of where your focus is in the present political context to do the best you can for women, for minorities, but also just for inclusion in, in general? Where, where can one put pressure and actually see something change? And how do you affect that pressure? You've been talking about the SEC and some other things, but talk a little more in terms of some of the results you've seen where what you have done is actually working and bringing some sort of a change, not just bringing something to light that then becomes an issue such as Tesla, but uh, where you actually have seen what you're doing affect some sort of change or move in the right direction. Sure, sure. Well, so, you know, again, most of our work we were investing at the intersection of environmental sustainability and social justice. So yeah. knowing that there's alpha or, or returns to be had when companies get those right, both of those right. You know, so, so what we're largely working on um, are the diversity and inclusion and really positive employee practices. So one example where um, we, we made some significant dialogue and had some success um, is at IBM. We wanted to see a diversity report and they were in the middle of changing their company structures and, and they went out into Kindle and this. And so they've had, um, uh, they said, we'll do it later. And we said, no, actually we, we need to see that now. You know, this diversity reporting is you start where you are and then mm. you only get better from there because once there's transparency about what's going on you only want to make that better mm. so um at any rate long story short they ended up going with us um, and supporting our resolution after you know many behind the scenes dialogue and um we won that at 94 percent of the vote mm. um earlier um actually before george floyd situation um had really bubbled up uh you know, within our country, we went with a small cybersecurity company, smallish, smaller, um, about a diversity report, and they didn't have any issues. So unlike Tesla and some of the others, they had zero issues. And yet we knew that reporting on the diversity and their efforts for inclusion was going to be really important moving forward. And we won that at 70% of the vote. So um, it's almost like dominoes, you know, like kind of setting up which ones to go, because we won't have to go after every single company for this. You know, the SEC will see that we're winning, that this is actually beneficial to companies. Um, mm. There's actually a book um, by a colleague, um, of ours, she started the Gender Equity Now certification program for US companies. Um, she has recently come out with a book called Inclusion Inc. And it's Sarah Sanford. And she really does outline all of the different policies and practices that do lead to change within a company. And so we consult with her frequently mm -hmm. um, and use a lot of her advice and her research um, when talking and engaging with each of our companies. Speaking of which, by the way, my, my producer, Ernie, is probably sitting there saying, how do we get in touch with her? Because she would be another good guest to have on. Why don't we do another one with you and have uh, both of you and talk through all this some more? Would you like to We would to love that? to do that. Yeah, we, we make a great team. So we would, we would be happy to do that. Well, that would be great. So Ernie uh, will take note and get back to you and try to connect with you and her. And we'll do a We'll do one on her book, but probably revisit some of the things we're talking about today, because I just think this is such an important um, topic. And, you know, to get back to Tesla for a minute, when you see what's happening there, how, you, you know, we, we have these fiefdoms uh, that have economies bigger than most countries run by one man, uh, tends to be a white man, tends to be someone on the libertarian side of politics, kind of an Ayn Rand creation, if you want to put it that way, you know, uh, the master, you know, of the universe type syndrome, uh, tied to huge egos that seem to be easily wounded and lash out. H how does one affect change in an absolute pre-revolution monarchy of, of 16th and 17th century France, as it were, transposed onto the, into the United States in, in a democracy in which they're running fiefdoms that really have no no uh, checks and balances whatsoever within the company. What what's all this about? And how many hundreds of billions of dollars are these males going to be wielding against change? And how does one still bring change when they have that power? That's completely non democratic and unelected and out of all proportion to normal checks and balances. I I just think it's an insurmountable problem. Am I wrong, or can this be changed? 
Um, so in many ways it feels insurmountable and yet uh, we do know that change happens and we see how, it. how though, because it seems to me the political side of things is so weak today in, in relationship to the power of corporations that, um, you know, the only major legislation that Donald Trump was able to effectuate was to lower the taxes on that class of people. And the Democrats yeah. have been power now and unable to tax those people, let alone, you know, even a small, tiny change in the tax code that would make billionaires slightly more accountable, apparently is out of the range of what Democrats can achieve. So what the hell? Right. So when you say Democrats are in power, you know, that that's that's up for question, right? If well, we yeah, exactly. It's up for question. You know, so yeah. how does one effectuate so, change? Right. So what we're seeing is that change happens one conversation at a time and that we all, those of us looking for that change need to be up for those conversations. So anytime we get to have that conversation with the SEC, we take it and we share with them our research and all of our activism and um, and we know that they're listening, um, talking to our congressmen. We also know that um, we get the economy that we invest into, just like we talked about, and that our industry, the financial economy and asset management changes by client request. So having those conversations, so moving money out of those bad player companies and into the solutions focused companies, if we all did that in our 401k, you know, in our investment accounts, changed our banks from the extractive banks into the solutions focused, community focused banks, yeah. we will have a different world. Mm -hmm. And we'll, you know, by nature of that, we'll be moving money out of the companies that are making the political donations that end up being pretty detrimental to both our economy, you know, our environment and our society. So that's why I'm doing this work is because we really know and we can see it. Um, and not only does it make a difference to our economy to move money out of the bad players, you know, the fossil fuel players, the, the large tech, um, you know, all of that, and then into those companies that have diversity and leadership that have revenues um, based on um, products and services that are beneficial to women um, and people of color, we will get that society we need. Hmm. What also has happened that we've seen as a ripple effect that's maybe just as important is that when individuals actually take that step to move their money, there's a piece of empowerment and ownership that comes with that. So hmm. what we're seeing is that first step of just knowing what we own, which it's kind of like taking the veils off. We call it opening the envelopes or mm -hmm. logging in, finding the passwords and finding out what do I actually own? What's in this account? We all have been individually so removed from mm -hmm. our investments. Um, and that may or may not be nefarious play, but the fact is we're very distant from our investments. So the to the extent that we can look at what we own, see what we own and move what we own into alignment with what is actually gonna be beneficial for us, what's gonna grow over time, our sustainable economy, right? So moving our, um, our investments in alignment with our own personal values and what's better and best for people and planet um, brings this source of not only financial impact empowerment, but just agency. And we are definitely seeing that agency play out in other realms. Um, so from, oh, wow, I've already moved my money. I see that I have enough for retirement. I'm going to grow that. I'm on a good track. Oh, I can switch jobs. I don't have to work in this whatever job now. I'm going to go for the one that's more in alignment that's going to bring this out or the other. Um, so we're seeing ripple effects throughout um, when people are moving their money. So that's, that, that's my answer. Hmm. And when you look at the power of the SEC to affect change, just tell us a little more about that. When you go to the SEC, why does Tesla even bother to care what they think? What is their particular hold over corporate America or corporate entities that gives the SEC uh, the ability to change anything when motivated to do so by people like you? So... Uh, well, so largely we get those conversations because we're part of a group that's called the 30% Coalition. Mm -hmm. And it's a group of asset managers that are all in um, conversation and working together to say, how can we hold companies accountable and what is the power? And, and I would say it's a right and also a responsibility of investors yeah. to not only own what they own, but to you know really be active and, uh, in, with what they own in responsible ownership. So it's with that group 
that we're able to have these conversations and we have their attention and they're, they're individuals as well and they're doing their job and their job is to really understand what are the risks and what are the opportunities and what are the responsibilities of their particular um, role within the SEC. Well, when it comes to some of these tech giants, I mean, let's just say that Elon Musk, you know, winds up owning or running Twitter or some other, uh, you know, information uh, highway, um, you know, if the system becomes weighted to the point where the same people who are making the problems also own the means of communicating what those problems might be in terms of the media itself, you really begin to have a closed loop. So how does the SEC intervene into a situation like that when the very uh, ability to have accurate information is in the hands of the very people who you're trying to change the corporations they control? It seems that we're right on the cusp of having a whole second set of problems, and that is that the internet as a means of communication is falling into the hands increasingly of a very small group of people and happens to be often the same type of people, if not the same people themselves, who are causing the very problems you're talking about on a massive scale that's almost hard to contemplate. Yeah, so the Twitter situation is largely problematic as you pointed out. Right, you know? yeah, so, yeah. Um, And as the founder- But it brings up an example of what can happen even if it doesn't happen. Right, right. So you know, from Russian bots to um, controlled accounts. You know, I think uh, Tesla has, you know, admitted that in the beginning there were some fake accounts that really um, pushed forward their message and got their message really out and rolling on, mm. you know, within Twitter. Um, so it has benefited their company already largely. Um, interesting comments from Jack Dorsey, who founder of Twitter, who he really is actually seeing Twitter as a, as a public good and, admitted that it probably shouldn't definitely shouldn't be privately owned but you know what would it look like to evolve that into um some other kind of entity you know mm -hmm. and so so um you know should the um I, I think that has to do you know with our new york times and with the washington post and with you know yeah. with all of our media whose job is that to govern? Uh, I think many of us feel that having a volatile ceo <laughs> Um, owning most of that company is not not the right thing for anybody. Yeah, and back in the day, you know, it seems like a million years ago, but it's within my lifetime, there was the idea of giving equal time to other points of view on television. I can remember I was already doing media things back in the 70s and 80s, and they would say, well, because we're having your, you on, we're going to have to have this person who represents the opposing view on. That's all gone. And then there was a, there were, there was some, there was some, regulation of, of monopolies when it came to radio stations and television stations, a limit of how many you could own and buy and how big those chains, in an effort to not allow this to happen, to have just a few huge players dominating everything. And now, you know, between Facebook and Twitter and a couple other players, um, everything else is almost incidental. I mean, they're driving the what we call the major media, which is really the minor media now, because these little bubbles are where it's actually all happening and these, these groups. I just think that the 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 fact that you already have these players with too much power and too much money, and now they're beginning to dabble in in at least thinking about taking over the means of communication as well. Uh, you know, this is more the stuff of a dystopian novel or futuristic movie than it is reality. But it's too much. It's too near reality now to for my comfort. How does that fit with what you're doing? Well, so if it's right there, because we're looking at what are the companies that are going to be part of our transition to mm. the next just and sustainable and inclusive economy, right? And so how can we invest into those companies and nudge them in the right direction if they're not already headed in that direction? And then for those that aren't headed in that direction or have so much possibility, you know, if you just think about Tesla, if you look at their revenue by products and services, they do align with uh, largely where we need to go as a sustainable mm. economy, and yet their policies and practices are not there at all. Mm. Um, and, and is that so, rooted in their leadership? Yes, that, that completely stems from the top. It's mm. very clear at that company that it stems from the top. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And so, and how does one change the top or pressure the top to change or the board or whomever may be there? 
that's what we're here to do that. Yeah. yeah. So raising that voice every way we can. And so, and that is by listening to employees and helping to empower them. It mm. is by, um, you know, speaking out to the media when they ask, you know, because we are doing so much careful research on these, um, you know, and then of course, talking to the SEC and filing with them um, mm. and then talking to our investors, you know, and empowering them to know what's going on and where their money is and, um, and where it's at work. Well, you know, we're going to leave it there, but please do bring your friend and author back. Let's talk about this some more and do another podcast on this. And Ernie will contact you. And I just want to tell anybody um, listening to this or watching it that um, wherever this podcast appears, wherever we put it online, there will be links uh, to uh, Kristen Hall, Kristen Hall and Impact Capital, who's a CEO of, of NIA Impact Capital, so that you don't have to be searching around on how to get in touch and or follow what she's doing. Um, so thank you so much for this conversation today. It re really amazing and informational, but also for the work you're doing. I appreciate it so much. And um, please do uh, put us in touch with your friend who's an author and anyone else who's working on this field, because I think, you know, stupid to sound hyperbolic, but of all the four, four or five things any human being could be doing with their life, you're doing probably the most important thing I can think of in terms of limiting this kind of corporate reach for bad things and helping to encourage something better, because that's where we all live. So thank you for trying to make our, our lives better, Kristen. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And I'll look forward to the next one. Thanks. Same here. Bye-bye. Okay. Take care. <laughs>